Alex, uh, can you begin to tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Um, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> my background is varied. I've, I've done, like many other people, done a lot of different things. Um, uh, I've had accounting practices. I've owned uh, commercial industrial businesses. Uh, um, currently, what I'm trying to do is uh, finish three books and i um, lecturing uh, across uh, Southern California and the Western states trying to get out information that I agreed to put out uh, regarding the Earth Dilemma, uh, the situation that we all face here. Um, unfortunately, uh, and I apologize, I'm two years behind schedule. I was supposed to start lecturing uh, two years prior to this. I've really been out since October of 93. It'll be almost a year. And um, uh, that's currently what I'm trying to do. So a lot of my energy and focus has been going towards that. Now, you're in contact with the Andromedans. Who exactly are the Andromedans? Um, they're a particular race uh, that exists in the constellation of Andromeda. Um, they're just one of thousands that exist out there. Um, they are the particular races that I talk to uh, and have had contact with and have uh, given me and shared information with me are human. Um, they're white skinned to light blue skinned, anywhere from four foot tall to eight feet tall. And they are human in, 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 ev in every way. Now, where, um, did, where did they originate, Alex? All human life originated in Lyra. Um, and when Lyra fell uh, during a war, uh, long before it's, uh, it, it, this one of the stars there exploded, um, they migrated out uh, from Lyra during a war uh, in, in order to preserve the race, and they went to different parts of our galaxy. Um, so all human life originated from Lyra originally. Um, because of their environment, they will... Uh, from generation to generation pick up physical changes um, depending upon the surface and the uh, organics of their planets or, and so on and so forth. Um, the different colored race skins uh, have to do with, with genetics involving the stars in which that they're exposed to. Um, so that's basically where they came from. So their primary home star then is Lyra? Yes. And is that currently Originally still their, their home star? No, there's no uh, human life in Lyra. So now where do they exist now? In the constellation of Andromeda. Okay, throughout the constellation? Yes. Okay, they, they must be very plentiful then. There must be a, a great vast civilization there. If yes, there exist. is. It's an ancient, ancient race. Have they described what their civilization is like to you? Yes, they have. And could you go into <laughs> sure. some of the details that, that strike you the most about them? their civilization? Um, they're uh, essentially, a, a, no matter where they are, they're a, a one-world government. Uh, and, uh, their society is would be approximately 4,700 years more advanced than ours on a spiritual level. On a technological level, they're, they're 50,000 years. Now, but a there's a balance between uh, their technology and their spiritual. In other words, the technology they create is based on, on a spiritual necessity to evolve and not on one to defend themselves, even though it can be used for that. Now, when you say 4,700 years advanced spiritually, yes. how, do, how do you measure spiritual advancement in years? I don't, I don't really know. That's, that's how, what they've, they've expressed to me. Oh, I see. Um, and they don't even use time. Uh, in, in their world. Uh, there's no such thing, really. Um, but they use those numbers to accommodate us so that we can use those as a point of reference. I see. Okay. Um, what do they, uh, do they call their world in, in their language? They don't, they don't speak. Everything is a symbol there. Uh, the whole race is telepathic. Um, and, and I want to uh, back up just a little bit. There are 28 different races there. Not all are human. Um, many are, are dimensional, plasmic, organic, uh, that were there before the human aspect of the Andromedans themselves or the Lyrans got there and became Andromedans. 
um, there's a lot of life on the different dimensional levels that if we were to go to fifth density, um, we would be physical on fifth density, even though here we're on third density, our perspective of them is being spirit. So, you know, on each of the different dimensions, there is an abundance of life that is completely different than how we would perceive it. Um, because, you know, our, our perception is of what third density is like. Even fourth density is very different, but we will have physical form in fourth density. Now, is third density the lowest density, or are there other lower? Uh, the animal and insect kingdoms would be, in, in planetary systems, uh, would be considered lower. But to be perfectly honest with you, I've not had a clear definition of that, because I haven't asked. Um, my focus really has been us, and where do we go from here? Right. So Now, the, what is the main difference between the third density and the fourth density? Um, the real difference is consciousness. Um, in fourth density, you can pretty much instantly create uh, what it is that you think. Whatever your thoughts are, you manifest almost instant. Well, it'll be almost instantaneously. Uh, so there is a, a major degree of responsibility in dealing with that. Also in fourth density, we become more of a group mind. Um, in fourth density, we're all telepathic. In other words, everybody can read each other's minds, which means you have to be real. You can't have hidden agendas because people will see right through you. Also in fourth density, uh, we all become clairvoyants. We'll be able to see energy fields, see life forms, um, which means that if you're hiding something, it'll be seen instantaneously. Um, they've also said that in fourth density, when we move into that, um, our court systems will change. There's still a, a positive and negative, but that exists all the way to the fifth density, where you will experience, to a, a strong degree, the, uh, the dualities in, in, in our everyday environments. Um, what will happen is you'll have a judge and you'll have a, a jury who will all be clairvoyants and they will read the energy field and know who's telling the truth and who isn't. Um, and, and everything will be judged based on that, will be based on energy, um, not on words. Uh, uh, when you, in fourth density, when you walk by somebody or you touch somebody's hand, you will instantly know everything about them. Um, so again, there will be no hidden agendas. Everybody will really have to be real. And if they choose to have and continue to play out their agendas, um, whatever those are, then they will have the space. But you will know, uh, or people will know, um, I will know who we're dealing with instantaneously. Um, what is there an economy, and what is the basis no. of their economy? Is it like a spiritual economy, or is it uh, like the value? I've heard some people describe their views of, of other extraterrestrial civilizations as having a spiritual economy where the amount of psychic energy you put into something is given a value. Have they d expressed any, uh, how their, their social systems work? Okay, I, I know a little bit about that. Essentially, everybody is given exactly what it is they need to evolve. Um, there are many different races and each, each race has own uniqueness about them based on their particular belief systems. And my understanding is that everything is a belief system. As far as the Andromedan culture, uh, children go to school, uh, or the Andromedans, they go through a birth process just like we do, those that are physical. They go to school for anywhere from 120 to 150 years. They're taught all of the major sciences and arts. Uh, there would be equivalent to PhDs or doctorates or masters, whatever you want to call it, in all of the arts. It is at that point, once they're done with all of that education, that they choose what it is that they wish to do or to evolve. And they can change their mind any time they want. The whole purpose is the evolution of the soul um, and life. They're given whatever it is that they need to do that. Um, I'm not aware of crime or um, uh, whatever. Uh, uh, or, or um, anything along those lines. Their whole focus is on education and not distraction. 
um, if it's something that is not educational, from what I've observed, it's just simply something they're not interested in. Um, they just have it within them to constantly evolve on, a, on an educational as well as a spiritual level. And whatever they need is there for them to use. I'm not aware of um, uh, them having to pay anything for it. No. Um, it's uh, it just, to my knowledge, it doesn't exist. Now, is art and music important to them, too? Yes, all of it is. Um, but those things are very different than what we perceive. Um, art is, is, the, is creation to them. Things that are created out of thought, um, out, of, out of the isness, what they call isness, the Pleiadians call creation what we call God. Things that are created just by thought, by, uh, by nature, they consider art. They use extensively holographic uh, technology. Um, music, their music is, is of, the, of the universe, of what the music that certain planets make as they rotate around their sun, uh, what different solar systems make as they revolve around their sun, and what whole systems, uh, the sounds and, and energy that they create, to them that's their music. And then they put things together, different uh, constellations, different star systems, they'll put those together and overlap them to create music. Um, it's different than what we just pull out of thin air here. How have they expressed uh, what their daily life is like? Uh, is, there a, is there a solar day for them, or is there a night or day, or what is their daily life like, or per periods of life? Um, there is really, to my knowledge, no set schedule. Uh, I'll give you the example of, of what I observed on one of their motherships. Um, they don't require much sleep, um, to, my, to my knowledge, um, simply because I guess uh, they're very healed. They're, they're beings, their physical form, um, they're just incredibly healed. Um, they're just in touch. Um, there is no night and day. Uh, they, they don't need to experience that although I'm, I'm sure other races have that, but the Andromedans don't. Um, they're just constantly stretching themselves, um, uh, trying to evolve and experience more and more and more all the time. Um, they're happy people. Um, they don't have the extremes of emotions that we express here. In fact, I've been told that virtually few races in the entire galaxy express the realm uh, of emotions that we, we experience here. Um, they're just always in, in, a, in a very wonderful space. Um, there's, they're, they're not a civilization that really judges. Um, they do accept things the way they are, um, with the exception of when those things threaten their particular lifestyle, or what they're about, their essence, um, and others, what uh, other uh, races might experience or, or perceive as a threat. Now, um, Alex, you said they're evolving uh, spiritually. What do they want to evolve towards? What spiritual goals do they have? I guess to be just the best that they are, to be completely at one with all that there is um, at all times. Um, you know, there are 11 creational densities, and my understanding is that within each of the different creational densities, you change your physical form. Their goal as a race is to go from, from, from the densities that they experience, which are three, three, four, and five, I guess, to move to five, six, seven, and eight, and then from there, eight, nine, and ten, and then to eleven, and now the new dimensional realm that's being created, twelve, is just to continue to evolve. Um, nobody knows exactly what the ultimate goal is, um, because the uh, the essences that they're in control, in touch with, that are on ninth, tenth, and eleventh, are continuing to evolve, and now there's a twelfth density that's being added to our universe, and they're being drawn up to experience this new density. So nobody really knows what the ultimate spiritual goal is. Um, they themselves are still searching for what God is. They know it exists. Um, but what it is, nobody really knows, which is why they call it the isness. It's, it's just a force that's there. And, and how we perceive it is based on how we perceive ourselves and our own belief structures, belief systems. And that's how we use the energy to create. 
Now, you mentioned that they're in contact with essences from the 9th, 10th, and 11th. Yes. Can you describe what they describe these beings to be like t to them and what they would be like to human beings? It's just pure consciousness. What their daily lives are like, I don't know. I don't have any idea. Have they described them at all in, in, in any sort of detail to you? Just light. Just light. Just light. Just light. <laughs> you know, that, that's all I know. Okay, now, uh, what abilities do the Andromedans possess that exceed those of Earth humans? You mentioned telepathy. Well, you mentioned see, that, that's an interesting question, and, and I don't know that I necessarily like the way you put it. The, la the, the abilities that they have are latent in everybody. They just haven't lived in a society that has been screwed with like we have been here. They're all telepathic. They're all clairvoyant. They're all healers because they're taught all of the sciences. Um, they're just, they're, they're whole. Uh, I, I guess that's, that's the only way that I can put it to you is that they're completely whole. Every soul knew, knows who they are. They know who they've been. They know what their reincarnational past has been. They as a soul have an, a personal agenda, which every time they incarnate, they're consciously aware of. So, so they know where they're going. They see improvement in themselves life after life after life. We, if we hadn't been so screwed with here, would have the same abilities. We could very much be where they are. Um, but we've been manipulated incredibly for the last 5,700 years. Um, on an intense level every day. Uh, our real manipulation really started about 14,000 years ago when um, the Orion group started uh, uh, manipulating our DNA structure. So um, it isn't that they're better because they're not. We're just different. We're a little bit behind than they are because of our, our manipulations here. Um, but the, the, the real bottom line here is we're all spirit. Um, we, we contain a soul. That soul is a part of all that is. And that soul has been really trying to be recognized in each of us. And it hasn't been because of the material and the belief systems that we have evolving around us being earth people, about being physical and about the real truths of our essence, of our existence, of who we are, having been blinded from us, from our spiritual teachings, uh, from the religions, and, uh, and us being convinced that we're something that we're not, that we're physical, that we're animal form, and we're not. We're spirit. Our spirit animates these physical forms, period. Alex, what is the Andromedan Council? It is a, excuse me, it is a, a political body um, that's represented by now 133 different uh, races and cultures and planetary systems. There are over 1,200 systems and planetary races, evolving races that are, that could be part of the Andromeda Council, but not all of them are. Um, uh, it is, it would be comparable to Earth here to to compare it to something too like a United Nations, except it's not a United Nations in the sense that um, it has a agenda. Um, the Andromedan Council, as, as, as a body, um, their, so their sole purpose is to facilitate evolvement of all life in the galaxy. And that's really what their goal is, is to allow all um, life forms to evolve on their own um, without manipulation. Uh, obviously that's not occurring here on Earth. And we're not the only ones. This is occurring on 22 other planets in our galaxy. Um, but the other planets are not um, stuck in the muck that we are to the degree that we are here. And this is a, a major concern for them because we're not, we're not moving in a direction uh, that we should be moving. There are elements here that are definitely holding us back. Um, and because Earth has become this, this, this real prize, and not only Earth, but us um, as well. So I'm, I'm getting off a little bit. Um, 
Okay. I want to stay with your questions. So its overall goals then are to elevate the spirituality of all life forms in their own particular ways. Evolutionary uh, ways, right. That okay. They evolve according to the degree of their consciousness. Now, how and why was it first brought into existence, the Andromeda? I don't know. Yeah. When um, did I do know that it was formed. It was formed shortly after the Orion Wars, which was a huge war that lasted 600,000 years in our galaxy. And it was predominantly between the humans, the human race, of which there's all kinds of humans, hundreds of billions of humans, and those of reptilian races that do coexist in our galaxy. Now, when there was no winner, by the way. Apparently, both sides got so tired of killing each other, they just kind of just stopped, and, and an undeclared truce was formed. And uh, I know in, in Orion, where there's a very large group, they have their own political group called the Orion Group, and the humans and other life forms that came together uh, formed the Andromedan Council. And there are others, you know, that are that are a small part of each of the of the galaxy, and, and other galaxies apparently have their own little groups where people come together and decide, um, you know, what's happening, or they communicate with each other. There's trade, there's bartering, there's a sharing of, of of wisdom, of knowledge, of essences, so that everything can evolve together, and uh, uh, you know, work work in in in, a, in an unconditional love type of of space. You're lucky. You're a lucky person, I think. I, I know you have a very difficult task, but I think you're very lucky to be given this wisdom. Um, I think you're very lucky. Uh, when did their interaction with human beings on Earth begin? 1980. 1980? 1980. And how did that begin, and what was the essence of that interaction? Okay. Um, it really all evolved around the Palladians themselves. Uh, Earth has been the subject of discussion for a long time. What really, the real attention and focus really started um, uh, when we started uh, detonating our first nuclear weapons. We did, as a race. Uh, nuclear weapons had been used here in our ancient past hundreds of thousands of years ago because uh, there have been wars here between a lot of different factions, predominantly most of them human. Um, the Pleiadians had agreed or offered to come back here and try to help raise the consciousness of the planet. Well, apparently what happened was that when they got here, uh, they were really faced with their past. Uh, the Pleiadians had had incredible civil wars amongst themselves and others, other wars. Um, and they had just moved into a fourth and fifth density consciousness and they didn't want to come back here and take the warrior space again. And because of the Greys' involvement, or involvement here, and the Orions, and a small group from Sirius B, and the Orion group, and a group from, Rig from Rigel that are here as well, <clears throat> and others, they didn't want to come back here and have to move into warrior space. So they started dragging their feet. In other words, they didn't do as much as they needed to do. Well, as this is occurring, you know, changes in our, in our galaxy are also occurring, and they're moving at a much faster rate. So the Andromedans finally said, well, you know, what are you doing? What is happening? What have you accomplished? And the Pleiadians basically said, you know, we're having our own conflicts dealing with this because the Pleiadians themselves have a tremendous amount of karma with, with our solar system, you know, with Mars and, and, and Earth. They simply just weren't as motivated as they should be or could have been to start making the changes here. They also had made some communications with the Earth governments that didn't go very well at all. So basically, they said, well, we don't know what to do. So the Andromedans themselves said, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. We'll, we'll take this because it is important for the whole. We'll make an effort. Now, the Andromedans were probably the better choice because they don't have any karmic ties to us. So they're, they're completely um, neutral and they're probably better observers as well because of their neutrality. So they've basically been taking over. And what they did was they got involved in 1980. Uh, they're working with the Pleiadians, with the Syrians. Um, uh, they have... Uh, Which group is Syrians? Uh, from Sirius A. Sirius A. 
um, so what they're doing here now is they're trying to raise the consciousness. They came back in time to 1964 to contact me. I'm not the only one. There are others. There are also other people who are, who are mediums or, or channels or whatever word you want to add to it, um, who are also getting information on a spiritual level. Octarians are also involved. And the whole point is, is they want our part of the galaxy to evolve. And what's holding it back is our solar system. And what's holding back our solar system is the consciousness of humanity on the Earth. The Earth herself, as an entity, spiritual entity, wants to move into, into fourth and fifth density. But she can't yet because of, of the consciousness of humanity. And in order for her to do it without humanity, one of th two things have to happen. Humanity either has to shape up, grow up, as the Andromedans say, or humanity has to be removed and get out of the way. Cleansed. Exactly. Uh, whatever term you want to use. Um, but those options don't necessarily involve us using our free will. So that's, that's the dilemma that we have. It's like uh, we, are, we are so so entrenched in our belief systems that the reality of our belief systems is being chipped away daily, you know, to what we think is real. And uh, an overlapping degree of thoughts and energy are being introduced that hopefully will open an our perspective, enough people's perspective, to the point where we can experience a real leap in consciousness here. And we have to do this quickly. We have to do this by 2001 um, in, in order to really... In a particular month? Uh, between July and August. And what's happening... That's the that, probability. What's happening between July, August, 2001? Well, basically nothing, but, you know, we're creating our future. Much of our, our future, that our belief systems is being focused on the Book of Revelations, on other prophetic disasters that are to occur. So you're talking about <clears throat> self-fulfilling prophecy? Right. We're literally going to create it. We're literally going to create our own demise. Because we're buying into belief systems that say, we ourselves are not mature enough or grown up enough to take care of our own selves. So we need somebody to come in here and take care of us. And that's an absolute recipe for disaster. Um, because, you know, who would want to come down here and save us from ourselves? Because then they're going to have to tell us what it is that we're going to have to do. We're not taking responsibility for ourselves. Um, you know, the Andromedans say that, um, you know, the divine plan is one of freedom. Any savior that comes down here and implements a government to save us, there's, freedoms will be taken away from you. So that whole system of belief was part of the system of control that was set up in the first place. That's right. It's, a lot of it has been uh, gray and Orion manipulations. Okay. And if you have time travel, it's very easy to go back in time and manipulate the future. It's very easy. And um, this they've done in an incredible way. You know, they haven't been here thousands of years like our government says. The Greys have really only been here 59 years. But because of their time travel capabilities, they've gone back in time and they've been able to manipulate series of histor historical events bring us to where we are now, to where we are asking for somebody to come in and save us. And they're already here. And if we ask because of our free will, will you please save us? Well, then we've asked for it. And we've gotten exactly what it is that we deserved because we didn't take responsibility as a race to fix our own problems and to deal with our own problems. We kept looking outside of ourselves. And, you know, this is why the Andromedans are so strong about us growing up and really taking responsibility for it. Now, how many human beings are, is the Andromeda Council in contact with on Earth? I, I remember you saying at one time four. To my knowledge, they're in contact with four. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I don't know if there are more, if there are going to be more. I know there's one in the United States, there's one in South America, one in Asia, one in Europe. Um, but there are other groups that are here, you know, over 170, who may also on some level be talking to people and communicating, whether it's physical or, or um, telepathic or 
um, uh, through mediumship, you know, dealing with the different spiritual levels. Um, th there's a lot of information that's being sent down here. Are they finding it's, it's effective? Is it working? To a degree, it's not working as quickly as they want, simply because most people are incredibly apathetic. Uh, they're, they're stuck in their 9 to 5. I have to make my mortgage payment. My kids got to get to school in the morning, and I don't give a damn about anything else. And unfortunately, that isn't going to work. It isn't going to save you. It isn't going to protect you. There's so much more going on here. You know, and we are just one small part of this whole picture that's going on. And we have to wake up. Period. Now, one of your contacts is a four foot 11 inch light blue skin being called Phaseus. That's correct. Please describe his or her personality in detail. Phaseus, well, he's very serious. He's very benevolent. He's, he's considered a sage. In, in his world. Um, he's an incredible healer. He has perspectives on things that are just far beyond any anything, anyone that I know. Um, he's very direct. He's very humble. He's very soft. Um, uh, he's he's uh, very direct. Um, and, and when he moves into a room, like we've, when I've walked with him or walked with the others, when we walk into rooms or different areas of motherships and, and, and the ships, energy changes. People, of course, they're very in touch with energy themselves. They instantly turn and they acknowledge him and they bow. Um, I guess he would be considered a, a Nishwish or a Yahweh, a, 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 an Admiral, or, or, a, or I don't want to use the word God. An elder. An elder, you know, of tremendous of wisdom and insight. And... Um, that they take very seriously what is going on here. And the manipulations, the things that the Greys, the Orions, and the Reptilians are doing here. Um, uh, they're appalled with what's going on here. Um, the other one is Morane. Well, let me, Morane. let me get to Morane in a second here. Uh, you mentioned directness twice. Uh, with that in mind, what was the most memorable interaction you have shared with Phaseus? They're all memorable. But I guess the single most, well, there's been two, one that just occurred. Um, but the prior to that, the single most important one was I had just had a contact, and uh, we had spent about an hour or so together, and I was very depressed, very sad. And as I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the ship, I was crying, and I turned around, and, and I looked at him. And he looked at me, and he smiled, and his words were, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry. That's been the most memorable one, only because of, of what that particular statement entails. Um, when we leave our physical form and, you know, what many of the uh, Catholicisms teach, you know, you're judged by God. It just simply isn't true. We judge ourselves. And, I, and what I read in that statement is that when we cross over, we look at the places in our life where we withheld love, that we maybe didn't give enough. And um, we judge ourselves on that. So uh, that's, that's been the most profound one for me. And Morinay, he's a seven and a half or eight foot snow white skin hairless being. Uh -huh. also, uh, he, he's light blue as well. Oh, light blue. I'm sorry. He's light blue. Uh, can you describe his or her? Oh, he. Can you describe his personality then in detail? He's serious, but he also has a really good sense of humor. Um, uh, he can snap me out of out of my depressions uh, very quickly, and he has just a different perspective on uh, uh, of looking at things. Um, he he also um, tends to be. Um, uh, part of their uh, their exploratory team. In other words, you know, when there are times when they need to defend themselves or they're confronted with something, he takes on a military type of role. Um, he's he's very very fatherly, <clears throat> big brother, big brother. Um, he's also one that you know he will he shows more emotion. He'll give you a hug or put his arm around you, um, and uh, uh, he just he's just really really wonderful in that sense. He's he's more he's more human in that sense. He's not as as sterile sometimes as Viseus, uh would, would would appear to be. It's not that they're not loving, but.
but you know sometimes this, uh, Morinet is a lot more animated. You know, and and I can I can um, uh, uh, relate relate more to him, and I think he can relate more to the emotions that we experience here, the the tremendous. Uh, uh, extremes that we experience. I think he's a little bit more in touch with that, you know, than maybe, maybe sometimes Viseas appears to be. Now let me ask you, uh, <coughs> what was the most memorable experience you've had with Mornay? I can't talk about that. <laughs> I won't talk about that. Okay. Um, now, please describe where and when you were born and your youth. That's not something I want to talk about either. Okay. In the tale... Because it's not about me. It's about the information. Okay. That's fine. In the tale, please describe your first contact at eight years of age in 1964. I didn't really know anything about it. Um, uh, I just knew that I supposedly had fallen asleep. And when I woke up, it was evening. Everybody had been looking for me, and I wasn't where I was. Um, you know, and when I took him back to show him where the imprint was, uh, uh, we were playing hide and go seek, and, and uh, this was in the peninsula of Michigan, near Woodstock, Michigan. And people had been looking for me, and I wasn't there, and I got a spanking, you know, because I wasn't where I was supposed to be, and I'd been missing for hours. Um, you know, and uh, I, I didn't really know what had occurred until the second contact, which was at age 14 where I was told what had happened, that they had given me a physical, um, they had given me a suggestion to forget because of my uh, family members just simply wouldn't understand. And they were right. They were what, very right about why that. Was the, uh, why was the physical necessary? Well, they do that all the time. They do that to, all, um, to everybody to, to make sure that you're physically fit because they genuinely care about your physical health. And if there are problems, they want to make us aware of it and, and maybe offer a suggestion, you know, like maybe you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Um, some people are even experiencing healings. And it's, it's just a genuine caring for, um, of acknowledging who you are, not only on a physical level, but on a spiritual level. Now at age 14, what was the nature of that contact? I was taken out of bed. Um, and I woke up and I was uh, on a table in a room. And this was my first introduction to Faseas and Morinay at least conscious introduction. And they were looking down, and I did, on a soul level, experience a recognition. There was no fear whatsoever. Um, and we talked, and they showed me some things about my physical self. Um, they, they also uh, uh, gave me a ball, which recorded um, my entire energy field, who I was, who I've been in past lives. And as it was recording this, you know, I could see all these different images of who I'd been going across the screen. And they, they saved this, and um, this was put into the computer so that they would contact me and could contact me no matter where they were at any particular time that they need to. Um, I was asked if I wanted to help them. I agreed to do this, um, although at the time I didn't know exactly what it would entail. I had uh, at any time the choice to say no more, uh, but it's been an incredible experience for me. Now, Alex, um you, uh, I presume then, uh, if you had soul recognition of them, that you had had previous incarnations with them. The Do you want to talk at all about any of that? No. Okay. No. Everybody on the earth is from someplace else. None of us were born and hatched here. None of us as souls were created here. We've all come, we all come from another time and place. My understanding is that all of the conscious spirit that's in this universe came through different black holes from other universes in time and space, which we simply aren't privy to. Um, so we've, we've, we're, we're ancient. There's no age to us. We, we weren't created with the universe. We came through another universe, through the black holes, um, to this place that we now call our universe to continue to evolve. That's everyone, virtually everyone. Um, you know, that contact at age 14, was that contact um, 
time travel in any way by the Andromedans to prepare you psychologically for your future contacts? Yes, they were all, they all, all, all the contacts is where they had to come back because they, they came here in 1980. All right. So they had to go back in time. And that's what they've done with, with a lot of people. Uh, um, even the Pleiadians, to some degree, I understand, have done that, where they go back and they start preparing people early for, for uh, responsibilities that they will have in the future, as opposed to hitting them all at once and saying, here you go, you know, just dumping it on your lap and you're saying, oh my God, what is this? You know, my whole reality. So there are increments of preparation that have occurred and continue to occur. And, and um, this is occurring with humanity on a whole in, in, in similar fashion, um, where information is being disseminated and little bits and pieces of ground roots people are starting to come together and really sensing change. And they're, they're, they're slowly but surely being brought to a level that when the real truth hits them, they'll be able to experience it, handle it, and, and um, assimilate it uh, for our good, you know. <clears throat> now, in 1985, your contacts with Paseus and Morney began to become more frequent. Um, please describe the nature of your contacts and the content of your discussions and the ways in which you communicate with them. We don't have enough time for that. Okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, we have put uh, together a series, uh, series one and series two, of this information. Um, in 1985, it, it really started to, uh, the information, they were physical, um, it, it evolved around uh, the greys, the earth agenda, our spirituality, religions, earth governments, um, earth history, our genetic creations, the 22 different races that have uh, actually colonized the earth at one time or another, and who we have within us genetic racial memories of, uh, within our DNA. Um, and present time, things that are occurring now, and probable, I stress, probable future events, because the future is being created every day, and it's being changed every day, um, based on our thoughts. So, I mean, just, just to sum up it, is, I, I couldn't, I, I would need 10 hours, okay. you know, that, that's not something I could very simply go into. Okay, um, but the, the series of eight, and so on and so forth, does in fact cover that. Okay. All that information. All right. Now, how does the symbol they gave you play a role in your contacts with them? Symbol. Uh, apparently, they gave you a symbol that you use oh, when you want to talk to them. Want to talk to them? It, the symbol was something that, that I chose. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, do they ever talk amongst themselves in a language you don't understand? But they, don't, they do, and it's not really a language. Um, or an they're telepathic, and, and yes, they, they, they'll, they'll stand in circles when they're talking, and, and when, when they do talk, um, flashes of light where their third eye is, right here, different flashes of colors, colors that we don't even have on our, our third density spectrum, just appear, and, and they're just boom, 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 flashing all this color, and it's like instantaneous sentences are being just communicated and there's some sometimes there's nodding sometimes there's uh, nodding this way or sometimes up and down sometimes you know there's gestures but all the time there's just flashes and their flashes is their is their language um, it's rare that I've been privy to what it is because they happen so fast I couldn't assimilate it so there are and some then, universal gestures then uh, yes yes, yes. <laughs> uh, all human beings are, are very animated Do yes they, they smile they also frown. 